This statue is named Laokoon and his sons. Carved from white marble, it dates back to the 1st century BC. Widely considered to be a masterpiece, there is nevertheless something wrong with it. After an arduous but failing 10-year siege of the city of Troy, the Greeks constructed a gift for the Trojans, a wooden horse. As they sailed away, the Trojans eagerly took in the horse as a victory trophy. This episode is related in Virgil's Aeneid, including the scene that is depicted in this statue. You see, before the Trojans decide to open their gates and let in the horse, someone warned them. Laokoon, a Trojan priest, knew about the incoming danger. He warned his countrymen, the Greeks have laid a trap, the horse will end up being the ruin of Troy if they let it in. But as he spoke these words, two serpents were summoned and seemingly out of nowhere, bit the Trojan priest as his children tried to save him. But all help came too late and Laokoon was swiftly killed. The serpents were sent by the god Poseidon, who took the side of the Greeks in the war. But to the Trojans, this sudden supernatural death of Laokoon was viewed as a sign of the gods to ignore his warning. They opened the gates of Troy, let the horse in, and you know what happens next. The statue depicts the moment of agony where Laokoon cries out in pain as the snakes bite and strangle him, and in the words of Virgil, he strange to burst the knots with his hands, his sacred headband drenched in blood and dark venom, while he sends terrible shouts up to the heavens, like the bellowing of a bull that has fled wounded from the altar, shaking the useless axe from its neck. But here is the problem. Does this look like a terrible shout to you? Theorists, writers, art critics and philosophers throughout the ages have noticed this discrepancy between Virgil's lines and the expression on Laokoon's face. Entire libraries of books have been written on the subject. They all deal with the question of why isn't Laokoon shrieking? He looks surprisingly calm for someone who just got bitten by poisonous snakes and is about to breathe his last. Where is the anguish, the harrowing pain, the bellowing of a bull, as Virgil put it? At best, he looks mildly inconvenienced. But surely the sculptor, who is unknown today, knew what he was doing. He expertly crafted Laokoon's body. His muscles contract, his body is exerted. Anatomically, this is what a body in pain looks like. But why not the face? The answer to this question will take us to the nature of art itself and how sculpture, painting and poetry differ from one another. It will force us to go deep into the history and philosophy of art and think about the nature of beauty and the role of art in promoting beauty. And the most logical place to start is with the work of Johann Joachim Winkelmann. By the way, lately I've been interested again in the ancient Greeks. And to refresh my memory, I've been listening to Plato's Republic on Blinkist, the sponsor of today's video. Blinkist allows you to understand the most important ideas from over 6,500 non-fiction books and podcasts in just 15 minutes. I was surprised by the large philosophy collection, not just with Plato, but a lot of Nietzsche as well. They have some of Nietzsche's main works, like Beyond Good and Evil, but also a recently released Nietzsche biography by Sue Predo called I Am Dynamite which offers a great overview of the man's life. With Blinkist, you can get up to speed with the highlights in just 15 minutes. Perfect for when you're doing chores at home or taking a walk. Blinkist also added a new feature called Spaces. You can create a space with friends or family where you can add, share or recommend titles from the Blinkist library all in one place in the app. All members of a shared space can access the titles in that space with or without a Blinkist subscription. Blinkist has a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Get a special discount of 60% on the Blinkist annual premium, valid only until November 21st. Start your 7-day free trial by clicking the link in the description box. Thank you to Blinkist for sponsoring this video. Now, back to Winkelmann and the Lao Koan. Winkelmann is an extremely influential figure in the domains of art history and archaeology with some people even calling him the father of archaeology. He is almost single-handedly responsible for the neoclassical movement in art, which sought to revive the aesthetic ideals of ancient Greece. His reports on the excavations in Pompeii, which was just being discovered at that time, 
were the first writings available to scholars on what exactly was being found there. His theory of aesthetics was to have a profound and lasting influence, not just on German culture, but on European culture in general. His magnum opus, The History of Art in Antiquity, was the first work in German that was considered to be a monumental contribution to European literature. For a time, the Winkelmann way to approach art was the only way to approach art. And luckily for us, he wrote extensively on the Laokoon group. What Winkelmann admired most in Greek art was the simple majesty that it represents. It's easier to show an example. For the ultimate representative of this Greek ideal, we need to look no further than another statue, which, like the Laokoon today, stands in the Vatican Museums. It's the Apollo Belvedere, another Roman copy of a Greek original. For Winkelmann, it exemplifies the Greek aesthetic ideal. Apollo doesn't seem to exert himself, even though the statue depicts the scene where the god has just shot an arrow to kill the serpent Python. Apollo has an air of nonchalance about him, befitting for a god. Even though he just participated in combat, he seems relaxed. After all, Apollo is a god, and as awe-inspiring as this feat may have been, it's still easy work for a deity. The combination of majesty together with stillness and tranquility is what Winkelmann found to be the most eminent feature of Greek sculpture, and he viewed it as an extension of the Greek sense of propriety and sense of proportion. As a consequence, great Greek art must depict its subject as essentially passionless. There is to be no room for exaggerated expressions, as this would take away from the grandeur of the statue. What makes the Apollo Belvedere so beautiful and masterful is that its sculptor did manage to fit in some emotion in his face. Winkelmann analyzes the statue as follows. The Apollo Belvedere was intended to represent this deity in a state of anger over the serpent, Python, slain by his arrows, and at the same time with a feeling of contempt for his victory, which to a god was an easy achievement. As the skillful artist wished to personify the most beautiful of gods, he expressed only the anger in the nose and the contempt on the lips. The latter emotion is manifested by the elevation of the lower lip, by which the chin is raised at the same time. The former is visible in the dilated nostrils. However, if you would just read those words without seeing the statue, it's extremely doubtful you'd imagine something like this. Rather, what's remarkable about the Apollo is his neutral facial expression, and certainly most people would never notice such subtle details as Winkelmann describes. Apollo's emotions are buried beneath his stoic tranquility, which was the Greek ideal. Apollo is undisturbed, unemotional, unbothered, nonchalant. Which brings us again to the Laokoon group. Alongside the Apollo Belvedere, Winkelmann considered the Laokoon a masterpiece of sculpture. But if Apollo was praised for his passionless, stoic demeanor, what does Winkelmann make of the Laokoon, whose face so clearly expresses an emotion? Here we run into a problem. Winkelmann has built an entire theory of art around the stately majesty and simple grandeur of Greek perfection and proportion. This is what all art should be, and what all modern art should strive to be. An imitation of Greek nonchalance. But then, what do we make of this sculpture, which is undeniably a powerful evocative piece of art that seems to break all the rules that Winkelmann has just set out? He seeks to find an answer in the soul of the statue. That might sound confusing, so let's use an analogy. As the bottom of the sea lies peaceful beneath a foaming surface, a great soul lies sedate beneath the strife of passions in Greek figures. Winkelmann cannot say that the Laokoon is bad art because it obviously isn't. So he has to find a solution. And he finds the solution in inviting the reader to contemplate the soul of the artwork. Yes, Lokoon is obviously in pain and suffering. In his description of the statue, Winkelmann focuses first on the body. Pangs piercing every muscle, every laboring nerve, pangs which we almost feel ourselves, while we consider only the belly contracted by excruciating pains. So far, so good. But let's return to the question we asked at the start of the video. Why isn't Laokoon shrieking? He's in immense pain, he's about to die from a snakebite. Virgil in the source material tells us he screams like a bellowing bull. His body is expertly sculpted to express his pain and suffering. But then, 
why not his face? Winkelmann finds the answer in the soul of the statue. Laokoon exemplifies the Greek ideal of stoic forbearance. Yes, he is suffering. Yes, he is in great pain. No, he cannot show it. Yet, show it he must. No man is made of steel. Not even the greatest stoic sage can remain undisturbed by a poisonous snakebite. So, Laokoon's face represents a middle ground between suffering and self-control. They balance each other out. In this way, Winkelmann can save his own theory. He injects a portion of quiet grandeur into a scene that is anything but quiet. Laokoon is not shrieking and shouting and losing control. He is suppressing his pain, trying to simply bear it according to the Greek ideal of decorum. Yes, he might not be as successful at suppressing his emotions as Apollo. But then again, Laokoon is not a god, but a mortal. He pierces not heaven like the Laokoon of Virgil. His mouth is rather opened to discharge an anxious, overloaded groan. The struggling body and the supporting mind exert themselves with equal strength. Nay, balance all the frame. So this is one answer we have for the problem of the non-shrieking Laokoon. Is this answer good enough? It certainly feels like a bit of a cop-out. And one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that while Winkelmann became famous for his descriptions of statues and for the literary quality of these descriptions, not everyone agreed with them. We already saw how he described the Apollo Belvedere. Flared nostrils, upper lip raised. Do you see those things in a statue? Lots of people didn't. And as Winkelmann's influence grew and people visited the same statues that he had described in his books, many expressed disappointment that the statues in real life don't live up to the spectacular descriptions Winkelmann provided. And Winkelmann's descriptions of Laokoon irked one German writer so much that he devoted an entire book to refuting it. A book that consequently became one of the most influential and important works in the history of aesthetics. We are speaking of the essay Laokoon by Gotthold Lessing. Lessing's Laokoon sets out to solve a problem. You see, for centuries, there existed the idea that poetry and painting aren't really different art forms. That is to say, they both aim at the same goal. Following Aristotle, the idea was that art should strive to imitate nature. That is as true for poetry as it is for painting. However, the problem is that painting, and when we say painting, we really mean all the pictorial arts, including sculpture, is simply much better at imitating nature than poetry is. Evidently, a sculpture of a wolf is much closer to an actual wolf than any literary description can ever be. So the idea took root that painting and sculpture are the superior arts, because they do the best job of imitating nature, which is, after all, the entire purpose of art. But you also can't just relegate poetry to the dustbin. So how to solve this conundrum? by making poetry more like painting. So we get these poems and books with long, detailed descriptions of scenes of nature, as if the writer is trying to paint a picture in our mind, word by word, sentence by sentence. Every leaf on a tree needs to be described in detail, so to speak. Art theorists in the 18 and 1900s were strengthened in their conviction due to an error in translation that seemed to persist for ages. The Roman poet Horace, 2,000 years ago, wrote a poem filled with advice for would-be poets, called the Ars Poetica, or Art of Poetry. In it, the following sentence occurs. As is painting, so is poetry. Some pieces will strike you more if you stand near, and some if you are at a greater distance. But, for some reason, in the random chaos of history, only the first few words taken in isolation started to live a life of their own. As is painting, so is poetry, or in Latin, ut pictura poesis. This fueled the idea that poetry and painting are essentially the same. They share the same ends, and as much as possible, should share the same methods. So we arrive at the notion of a poet being like a painter who uses words instead of paint. His objective is to paint a picture in our mind. Of course, when we have the full context of the quote of Horace, we can see that he didn't mean anything of the sort. He simply pointed out some similarity between poetry and painting. But as happens often in history, context gets lost or twisted, and ideas start to lead a life of their own. And so we arrive at the Laokoon. 
Originally, the story of Laokoon was presented to us in the form of poetry, Virgil's Aeneid. The sculptor, in turn, made the scene into marble. Winkelmann interpreted the sculpture in the way we just outlined, ut pictura poesis. Thus, for Winkelmann, the object of the sculptor was to recreate the scene from the poetry as faithfully as possible. But we run into the same problem. Why isn't Laokoon screaming? Virgil is quite clear on this. He writes that Laokoon bellowed like a bull as he was being bitten. We saw that Winkelmann tried to solve this conundrum by injecting some measure of stoic self-control into the character. Yes, he may bellow like a bull, but he tries to hide his pain as best as possible. But for Lessing, this explanation was not good enough. For Lessing, the problem was more fundamental. Lessing started to question the idea that painting and poetry are the same. That might sound obvious today, but it wasn't quite so obvious in the past. Lessing argued there was a fundamental difference in how poetry and picture function as art. The main difference has to do with time. You may have noticed that a marble statue cannot move. The artist has to choose one moment to immortalize in stone. The poet, by contrast, can describe a whole sequence of events. This makes poetry and painting fundamentally different, according to Lessing. So why isn't Laokoon screaming? Lessing's answer is, imagine how ridiculous it would look if he did. Human emotion is a matter of milliseconds. Imagine startling someone. The look of shock on their face as you surprise them really only exists for a few seconds at most. Their mouth gapes open, their eyes widen, they give a short shriek, they might even recoil, but they quickly regain their composure and return to a more neutral facial expression. Have you ever watched a bad TV show or movie? One of the hallmarks of bad acting is exaggeration. An actor pretends to be shocked, and he keeps the shocked expression on his face for minutes, mouths open, eyes wide, he looks like a caricature. It looks ridiculous. It takes you, the viewer, out of the moment. It breaks immersion. That is the danger that the sculptor faces if, for his subject, he chooses the wrong moment to depict in stone. As Lessing writes, Simply imagine Laokuon's mouth forced wide open and then judge. Imagine him screaming and then look. From a form which inspires pity because it possessed beauty and pain at the same time, it has now become an ugly, repulsive form from which we gladly turn away. The poet doesn't have this problem. Virgil can write Laokuon bellowed like a bull and will imagine the scene. The sculptor, on the other hand, must choose the moment to depict very carefully. And so the Laokuon doesn't depict the shrieking Laokuon at the climax of his pain and anguish, but at a moment right after, during the aftershock. That is why Laokuon is not screaming. This essay by Lessing proved to be a huge influence on German culture. It lured German artists away from Rococo and Baroque into Romanticism. Poets stopped writing lengthy descriptions of scenes of nature and focused on human reactions to beauty instead of trying to describe beauty in an objective sense. It made poetry more subjective and brought it closer to what we would understand as poetry in the modern day, namely an exploration of moods and thoughts rather than descriptions of action. But while this essay proved to have a lasting influence on the direction of German culture and art, the last word about Laokuon was still not said. You're watching Valgeist on YouTube, and if you're a returning viewer, you know that we're going to talk about either Schopenhauer or Nietzsche. And indeed, somewhere tucked away in the thousands of pages that span the world as will and representation, Schopenhauer has something to say about the Laokuon problem. After spending some time to summarize the problem of the non-shrieking Laokuon, in which Schopenhauer reiterates the positions of Winkelmann and Lessing, but also of Goethe and other contemporaries, because indeed countless books had been written on the subject at this time, Schopenhauer finally says, I cannot but wonder that such thoughtful and acute men should laboriously bring far-fetched and insufficient reasons, should resort to psychological and physiological arguments to explain a matter the reason of which lies so near at hand and is obvious at once to the unprejudiced, and especially I wonder that Lessing, who came so near to the true explanation, should yet have entirely missed the real point. Typical of Schopenhauer, who hated flowery and overly complicated language in philosophy, and sought simplicity everywhere, 
he has a simple solution to the problem. A solution so simple, in fact, that he can barely believe all those intelligent men before him have missed it. You may have noticed that marble is silent. A shrieking Lao Kuan could not be produced in marble, but only a figure with a mouth open, vainly endeavoring to shriek, a Lao Kuan whose voice has stuck in his throat. The essence of shrieking, and consequently its effect upon the onlooker, lies entirely in sound, not in the distortion of the mouth. Because the effect of a shriek lies in sound, and because stone cannot make a sound, the artist had to employ other means to communicate Lao Kuan's pain to us. Schopenhauer says that he succeeded at this marvelously, and he quotes with approval Winkelmann's description of the distorted limbs and strained nerves, the flexed muscles as Lao Kuan feels the bite of the snake. But, he says, we have to subtract from Winkelmann's analysis the stoical view which underlies it. For Schopenhauer, Winkelmann's theorizing on the noble character of Lao Kuan is simply too far-fetched. Lessing got close, but missed the mark. He wrote an entire book about the difference between poetry and painting, just to try and solve this problem, when the solution was staring at him right in the face. The answer is clear as day. Why doesn't Lao Kuan shriek? Because a statue cannot shout. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, subscribe and comment, as this really helps out the channel. I also want to thank the generous support of our Patreons, whose generous donations keep the channel alive. If you so please, you can join their ranks and get access to a dozen exclusive videos we made just for them. Check the link in the description box where you'll also find Blinkist's latest offer, the sponsor of this video. Thank you again to Blinkist. And with that said, thanks again and we'll see you in the next one.